Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neera Tanda, and I'm honored to welcome you here to the Center for American Progress. I want to thank you all for joining us for what I know will be a fascinating conversation about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we're here to really have a discussion about Sidney Blumenthal's new book, which is um, the first part of a multi-part multi series on Lincoln. And I don't really think this volume could come at a more important time because it reminds us, amidst the crazy rhetoric of politics today, that actually politics is, uh, has been and can be again about noble challenges, has been and can be again about change and progress. And we see in the example of Lincoln, leader, a leader who can make our country more fair and more just. And I think that is a great reminder at the time we're in right now. We have come a long way from Lincoln's America. We still face, but we still face some of the same fundamental questions about our national identity. Will America be more exclusive or inclusive? Will we treat our, each other with malice or charity? Will we be ruled by fear or prejudice? Or will we appeal to the better angels of our nature? Take someone with true intellect and some audacity to bring fresh insights to Lincoln's story, let alone write a long volume on his on this history. But luckily, Sidney Blumenthal is just the right man for the task. In this first volume, Sid uses his reporting chops and political acumen to bring a young Abraham Lincoln into full and clear focus. From Lincoln's humble beginnings in the backwoods of Kentucky, through his time in the state legislature of Illinois, Sid shows us how Lincoln grew into the leader our nation needed in its darkest hour, and perhaps gives us insight into the kind of leader our nation would need today. I've known Sid for a long time. Like a lot of people in public life, sometimes he's a little misunderstood. But his newest book reaffirms Sid's greatest contributions, which is really an astute observer of politics and the power to create change, the power politics can make to, to have to create change. Joining Sid on today's panel is Michael Lind. Michael is a fellow Lincoln scholar and the co-founder of one of our pure think tanks, New America. His book, What Lincoln Believed, The Values and Convictions of America's Greatest President, was published by Doubleday in 2005. We're excited to both host, host both of them at CAP, and we hope you'll enjoy the conversation. Uh, John Halpin, who's a senior fellow here at CAP and uh, has been a great leader for, for the institution over many years and really leads our Progressive Studies program, will be moderating this session. So without further ado, come on up. Where do you want us to sit? You sit here and Michael there, yeah? Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Halpin. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here at CAP. I'm going to moderate today's discussion. We like to do book events in a more informal way rather than long speeches and things of that nature. So we're going to try and keep it loose. It's lunchtime uh, and try and keep it informal. Uh, I can't recommend this book enough, the, uh, A Self-Made Man, Political Life of Abraham Lincoln. My kids are in high school now. And they're always complaining about the dry history they have to read. I'm going to, I'm going to make them read this book a, as an example of good narrative journalistic history. It really is a compelling and uh, fascinating read. Um, so I'm glad I, was, I, I, I read it for this event. So I, I want to thank you for that, Sid. Um, the way I want to start, um, and Michael, you've written about this as well, there, there's a ton of mythology around Abraham Lincoln. Uh, most of it comes after his death. He's the, the saver of the union, the great commoner, the great emancipator. Um, and one of the things you mentioned is this notion that he's a man above politics, which you really puncture all of this in, in certain ways, and presents a, a picture of, of Lincoln as a man of his times, both in terms of his intellectual history and the politics of the day, that we don't understand Lincoln as some deductive thinker. He, he, he's a tactical politician in many ways, and it's a, it's a fascinating portrait. And so, Sid, I just want to kick it off with you. Uh, telling us a bit about your views on the overall mythology of Lincoln and why you chose to write this book and what you ultimately want people to take away from it. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, John. And uh, thanks to Nira. Uh, and first, I want to say that I'm honored to be here at the Center for American Progress, which is uh, one of the most important public policy institutions in Washington and the nation. Um, so, uh, when we think of Lincoln, we approach this gigantic marble statue not far from here. And he's immobile. 
and he's above us. Um, there, are, there were whole generations uh, of Lincoln historians who wrote about Lincoln as being above politics, as only entering politics because he had to. That is a false picture of Lincoln. Lincoln actually was not up in the high chair. He actually walked in those very places um, that we have in Washington, around the hill. He lived on the hill. And um, he is somebody who was an impoverished, stunted, oppressed boy who called himself a slave, uh, had a difficult relationship with his father, separated himself from his family, educated himself, um, spent only a few weeks in uh, formal education, if it could be called that, in uh, rural Indiana, uh, and uh, became a skilled politician. One of the first members of the generation of professional politicians in America. Uh, previously, politics was uh, something for the landed gentry. Lincoln was of a new class of men, self-made men, who made themselves through politics. And, the, and uh, his, he gained these political skills from the ground up in every single venue of politics, from country store debating societies, from post offices, from working for, running for the lo local offices at the lowest level, campaigns and elections all the way up, and um, creating uh, the whole state convention system in order to make himself a congressman and deny a competitor. And mastering all of these skills, uh, which enabled him to become president and to emancipate the slaves and save the United States. These are not two separate things, and Lincoln is not two separate men. They are one and the same. There is not a great emancipator and somebody who's a grubby politician. They're the same person and the same uh, skills are required in order to achieve great principles. And Lincoln knew that and understood it. And he knew that it required a thousand small acts to do one important thing. We want to get to some of the, the origins of his actual uh, intellectual development, his political views. But first, Michael, I mean, do you agree with this, this sentiment based on your research and, and work on Lincoln, <coughs> a more pragmatic understanding of, of Lincoln as a product of his times, a great man, obviously, but not something that's a, a beyond what, what other people could possibly be? Well, uh, Henry Louis Gates has written of the Santa Clausification of Martin Luther King, Jr., uh, that is, you, you take uh, these great Americans or other historical figures out of their contexts and uh, eliminate everything that was controversial, uh, either in their beliefs or in their actions. Uh, and so the first thing you have to do as a historian is uh, show particularly political leaders in their context. But there's, an, there's another challenge. Uh, you know, a great political leaders, uh, uh, including great evil ones, and, and uh, John C. Calhoun sort of plays this role, in, in uh, this uh, uh, book, uh, they actually do have ideas. Uh, but be, they're, because they're politicians, they pursue those ideas uh, uh, in a way uh, that involves mobilizing uh, other people and, and biding their time and knowing when to strike and, and when to wait and so on. And it's very difficult to get this balance if you're a biographer. You know? uh, and the, the first and most essential thing for the biographer of, of, of a politician is to understand the ideas that motivate them because there's this perception in the public that most politicians are just unprincipled, corrupt people. Uh, the successful politicians, even if you disagree with them, they have some vision of the world. Usually they acquired it in their youth, before the age of 30 or so. Uh, but then because they're master politicians, uh, uh, you know, they've mastered all of these uh, practical arts. Uh, and, and by that test, uh, uh, this is a, a brilliant and absolutely convincing study. Uh, Sid, uh, in terms of Lincoln's worldview, to the extent that I've been able you know, to understand it, and I, th I think he gets it absolutely right. He avoids the presentist temptation to try to fit Lincoln into early 21st century categories. You know, Lincoln was a free thinker you know, who did not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. 
uh, a protectionist, uh, an advocate of, of, of powerful federal government, an opponent of, of slavery and racism. These are not combinations that really exist quite in the same way and haven't existed really since the 19th century. So in the worldview, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Sid gets this right. But the great benefit of this biography, which surpasses others, in my opinion, is because uh, Sid himself has a background in journalism and in, in uh, politics. He goes into depth in the things that most biographers skip over in order to get to the areas that they can relate to as individuals, which is marriage, family life, and so on. It's not that that's not in there, but this is a biography of a politician. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think it brilliantly tells how these principles that Lincoln held were pursued in this very opportunistic and pragmatic way. That's great. Sid, the, um, one of the things that's fascinating in terms of the, the context for Lincoln's rise is the self-taught nature of, it, of his intellectual and political ideas and, and how much, uh, they, they kind of come off as a hodgepodge in some ways. He has personal experiences on the river going down to New Orleans and seeing slave markets. He hears Baptist preachers. He, he's into the Revised Statutes of Indiana, something he, he would spend a lot of time studying. He read a variety of other books. In, in your, your estimation here, how did these forces work to influence his overall thinking and, and what ideas did he take away from this um, amalgam of, of, of different sources in some ways. Yeah, I hate to interrupt Mike talking about my book. <laughs> um, uh, Lincoln, um, as I said, had only a few weeks of formal education in a uh, backwoods school that was called the Blab School where they made uh, the pupils memorize things and repeat it. Only a few weeks. Everything else he gained on his own. So there was nothing systematic in, how, in Lincoln's self-education. It, it's how he managed to learn it. He was very uh, curious about the world, uh, and his uh, father discouraged, tried to discourage him from reading, and try, uh, which he thought it was um, a waste of time, a form of laziness would prevent uh, young Lincoln from learning a, uh, a trade, uh, and Lincoln was protected by his stepmother. For reading. He would also, his father rented him out as an indentured servant until he was 21. That's why Lincoln thought of himself as a slave. Lincoln wa was a wandering labor boy in rural Indiana, and he would find older men who had libraries and who were the professional men of their day. They were lawyers in various, uh, y you know, counties that worked in the, in the courthouses, and he would read through their libraries, and that's how he discovered uh, the law, it's how he discovered, we first read the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, history of the United States. Uh, he, and he wrote uh, a little, as a child, uh, an, an account of what, what the United States was and got it published in a, in a local newspaper through one of these uh, lawyers who he met. Um, Lincoln um, revolted against his background. He wanted to rise above it. He, did not like talking about it. He felt uh, humiliated, degraded, and a sense of social inferiority that he always carried with him. Um, even in his presidency, he referred to himself privately as a poor nobody, uh, especially in relationship to his wife, who was of the Southern upper class. Um, and he felt grateful to her um, for marrying him. Lincoln revolted against uh, his uh, religion. Uh, he was raised um, in uh, pri primitive Baptist churches. Uh, he was, um, they, they also happened to be highly unusual. They were called emancipationists. They were anti-slavery in Kentucky in the early part of the 19th century. They, uh, and Lincoln's parents were anti-slavery. Lincoln said he was, in one of his early autobiographies, naturally anti-slavery. He sort of had it in his DNA, and it came that way. His father fled Kentucky because he was competing for wages against slaves and uh, into a free state. And Lincoln would later say, slave states are states for poor white people to remove themselves from, not to go to. So, but Lincoln um, uh, became a free thinker. Uh, he read Tom Paine's Age of Reason. He read other uh, religious works uh, uh, against established religion. Um, 
He uh, uh, never really believed in the divinity of Jesus. He wrote a tract about it as a young man that one of his friends grabbed from his hands, put in a stove, and burned in order to protect his political viability. His first race for Congress, the entire issue was his infidelity, his lack of religious belief. He ran against a preacher named Peter Cartwright, who was the Democratic candidate, who ran a negative campaign against Lincoln as a non-believer. Lincoln had to say, I would not support anyone who didn't, did not respect religion. It was, it was uh, very lawyerly, even early on. Um, Lincoln acquires many ideas along the way, uh, uh, particularly involving uh, slavery, involving the nature of the American economy, which he experiences himself firsthand. Uh, as a boy, he helps uh, build uh, uh, one of the uh, canals uh, on the Ohio River, and he, he is a big believer in government expenditure for infrastructure. Uh, and a strong government role. Um, uh, and uh, so he, uh, we could go into enormous detail. He, and you mentioned the New Orleans experience, and I, I'll just mention that in passing. He goes down um, the Mississippi, something like Huck Finn. And um, built the raft, right? He, he, built, he builds the raft with. Uh, uh, someone he knows, a young man he knows, and they carry uh, hogs and flour down the Mississippi to New Orleans. New Orleans is, I would say, probably the third biggest city in the United States at the time. It's uh, one of the leading banking centers, and uh, it's an open-air emporium for slaves who are sold on street corners, including attractive young women. Um, and uh, by the accounts of people who were with him, and we have nothing from Lincoln himself on, new, on that experience, uh, he was horrified by it and wanted uh, to destroy slavery. So uh, it made an impression on him, according to those who were with him. I want to follow up on his, his views on race, but I first want to give you um, a chance to talk about his economic ideology. You've written a fair amount about this. The, the, the understanding of the support for the American system of internal improvements and protective tariffs and other things of that nature. How, how did Lincoln, for both of you really, but start with Michael, come to get these, these Whiggish views and, and, and what, what, what's the origin and how did they develop over time? Well, Lincoln, when he was young, read a biography of uh, Henry Clay, who would play a major role in his life. And, and then he married into a family that was you know, closely connected to Clay. Uh, since Clay was never president, we don't study him, but he was much more important than many uh, uh, presidents were. And uh, Clay uh, came up with what was called the American system, building to some degree on what not only Alexander Hamilton, but uh, uh, Albert Gallatin had, had done during the Jefferson administration, <coughs> consisting of a national bank, internal improvements, uh, and a high tariff to protect infant American uh, industries, uh, mostly from uh, British import uh, competition until they could be established. And so this was a system. and. I, th I think you know Lincoln, according to uh, you know his, his uh, law partner Herndon and many others, uh, had a, had a very systematic mind. He was drawn towards logical, interrelating systems, and I think that was part of the appeal that there was this American system. As a legislator, as uh, Sid uh, very very uh, brilliantly describes in the book, uh, he he tried to create a version of this on the state level, uh, with his uh, Whig allies. The the, uh, the system it was called in Illinois in the 1830s, uh, thanks to the the panic which was caused uh, partly by the Jackson administration's disastrous monetary policies, you know, uh, that went, a lot of the, these projects went bankrupt, but it was canals, uh, you know, it, he was a booster. Uh, and there were no boosters more ardent in the 19th century, or even the 18th century, than Southern boosters. And you get this paradox that, that some of the great champions of a strong federal government and of, of federal role in economic development grew up in this southern slave society or similar slave societies. You had George Washington, who was just amazed when he visited New England at how advanced the New Englanders were. Uh, and from that time onward, uh, he was a great champion of, of a strong federal government, the, the Chesapeake and Ohio uh, Canal uh, out here. Alexander Hamilton growing up in the West Indies. Uh, Lincoln with his family, you know, that was sort of escaping from the slave south. Uh, and we don't think of this as, as terribly romantic nowadays, uh, uh, but 
you know, it wasn't simply a matter of Chamber of Commerce, you know, JC boosterism. It was a matter of modernization. You, you have to think about Lincoln uh, and his fellow Whigs as being, you know, like the, the group in a third world country, in a developing country, yeah, yeah. looking towards science and modernity. Um, Mike makes a really important point. Lincoln, we think of as a kind of antique figure. Yeah. Not at all. Lincoln is a completely modern figure interested in modernization and obsessed with innovation, including technology. He's the only president who holds a patent. He represented innovative companies as a lawyer. Uh, he was very uh, interested in technology, and, uh, and he, he tried to understand it. He, was also, he also had, as you point out, a logical mind and worked on it. Remember, he's self-educated. Uh, his fellow lawyers recall him in rooms in county, uh, after they've been practicing in county courthouses in central Illinois, staying in uh, rooming houses, uh, sharing uh, many beds in one room. Lincoln staying up reading by, uh, by light uh, uh, the volumes of Euclid in order to improve his mind and learn how to be a better logician. And that applied not only to being a lawyer and win his arguments there, but being a politician and winning his arguments there. There were fragments of his writing discovered after his death from this period where he's using Euclidean concepts of his, if A is B, if B is C, about slavery and how to talk about it. So, um, Lincoln um, as, uh, becomes at the age of 27 the Whig floor leader in the, in the Illinois state legislature. And he succeeds in passing his version of Henry Clay's American system in Illinois. It's call, and he calls it the system. Well, and he wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton. He aspired to Illinois. be the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois. DeWitt Clinton was the governor of, of New York who created many public works. The uh, Erie Canal. Yeah, with the Illinois and Michigan Canal, which still exists, which goes from Lake Michigan to the Mississippi, was Lincoln's. Lincoln is responsible for that. It still exists. Um, the whole, his whole vast project involving large expenditure collapsed in the Panic of 1837, which was caused by uh, the Jacksonian um, economic program, such as it was, and the collapse of, of familiar to us, um, the derivatives market uh, in, uh, involving the banks who were o overextended and built on them, both here and in London, and the derivatives were built on mortgages, and that sounds familiar to us, and the mortgages were built on the value of the most important property in the United States outside of all the land, the slaves themselves turned into mortgages, turned into derivatives, and the whole thing collapsed. And um, Lincoln became, read widely, he read widely in economics. He read laissez-faire books, and he read anti-laissez-faire books. He, uh, uh, he became a uh, follower of a man named Henry Carey. Henry Carey was a Pennsylvania uh, manufacturer uh, and one of America's uh, foremost and early what was called political economists. His father was an associate of Benjamin Franklin in Pennsylvania. Uh, Carey was an opponent of laissez-faire, a, a, a proponent of modernization, of innovation, of a strong government role in that, of uh, active government programs. Uh, uh, they're different than what we might have today, but um, that's what uh, he proposed. He was an, he analyzed the role of slavery in globalization and, the, and its relationship to uh, laissez-faire ideology and its relationship to the British Empire and imperialism. And Lincoln believed all of it, read it all, and when he became president, Henry Carey was his closest economic advisor. That is a very and, little and, uh, known. And Karl, Karl Marx called Kerry the only important economist uh, the United States has produced. <laughs> so, and and, and he you, opposed him. Yeah. Can you all talk briefly about how Lincoln, if at all at this stage in his life, in the first volume here, 
connected his economic ideas to his views about protecting republicanism and democracy? Were they, were they linked at that time, or are they just separate, separate, separate theories, so to speak? Well, um, they, were, they were not separate theories. Lincoln saw this as part of the development, essential development of the United States as a nation, which he did not separate from the idea of the, um, of the uh, strength and growth of democracy itself. Uh, he was not anti-commercial. He was not against a commercial republic, but he also saw a very strong government role in that. Uh, and he was also, and became increasingly, as the issue became more pressing, anti-slavery. So the, um, there were different ideas of what the economic system was in the United States. Uh, slavery was not a system apart. It was the economic system in the United States. We can't think of it as a separate system or something isolated. Uh, it involved um, Wall Street. It involved State Street in Boston. It was highly financialized. Uh, it was uh, the most profitable um, part of the economy. Uh, owning a slave was like owning a Mercedes. Uh, people who owned slaves were very wealthy. The 10 wealthiest counties in the United States before the Civil War were all in the South. Not one of them was in the North. That was due to slavery. Uh, slavery was a great part of the globalization of the U.S. economy. Uh, the, uh, the slaveholders were for laissez-faire. They were for low tariffs because of the cotton trade, with, especially with Britain, which was uh, intimately linked to this. So Lincoln understood all of this. So when he's talking about his economic views, he's also talking about slavery. And he's also talking about free labor, and, uh, which goes back to his own family story of fleeing from slavery as poor whites. Yeah, to, you know, today, because of the 20th century history, late 19th, we tend to think of industrial capitalists versus labor. Uh, but during this period of Lincoln's lifetime, all the way up until maybe the 1880s, 1890s, when you got the first big industrial corporations, uh, the Whig idea, and Lincoln was a Whig in his early career, of the harmony of interests, you had to create this expanding modern economy, which was based on industrial capitalism and free labor. And it was going to replace this older, essentially feudal medieval system. That's how they viewed it. Uh, where you owned people, but it wasn't just slavery. It was all forms of unfree labor. It, so there was a movement to get rid of indentured servitude. Uh, the movement to actually have wage labor. Wage labor was an artificial construct in the Northeast and in the Midwest in the 19th century because you had to do all kinds of things. You know, you had, you had to uh, uh, it, move from a system where you rented out your labor, you know, or, or you were a tenant farmer or an indentured servant or something like that. So this idea that you go in, you perform work, and you're paid by the employer, this was a great progressive, you know, small p cause in the 19th century. And the two were intimately related in the minds of, of these uh, modernizing Whigs and later Republicans uh, who, who saw industrial capitalism and pro-labor forces as partners against the common enemy, this pre-modern plantation system. We forget that, there, uh, that emancipation took place in the North before the Civil right. War, that slavery existed throughout the North. Um, uh, in Massachusetts, in the end of the 18th century, there was a legal case that was argued by a man named Levi Lincoln, who later became Jefferson's uh, uh, Secretary of State and Governor of Massachusetts, who was distantly related to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh, in New York, there was a long movement that took place. Aaron Burr, by the way, was uh, instrumental in this, in abolishing slavery in New York. William Seward, who becomes the close political ally and Lincoln's Secretary of State, grew up in upstate New York with slaves in his family in New York. So um, this is um, in New York, this by is, the way. This is an evolving economic system, and slavery itself is evolving, and emancipation itself is an evolving movement that people live with and are aware of. In New York, by the way, that we get the term boss 
uh, was, was a New York Dutch term. It's because in this period, the workers in New York and the Northeast refused to use the term master for employers. Because, you know, so they wanted to distinguish the worker-employer relation. So let me follow up on some, some other aspects about his, his, his egalitarian thinking. I mean, we know he's anti-slavery, but as you point out, his, his views more broadly are a little more complicated on race, and I, maybe the, to, uh, both of you can talk about this. He's, he's not an abolitionist, although he defends them. He, he's, he buys on to some early theories about colonization, uh, returning slaves back to either Africa or cent Central America. And it's in some of the Douglas debates, he doesn't come off as all that egalitarian on, on, on racial equity measures. Obviously, this is the middle of the uh, 19th century. But can you both just explain briefly what you've learned and, and you know, the complexity of his views about race? As they were, he's clearly anti-slavery, but what, what else do we know about Lincoln at this period of his life? Well, let's take the abolitionism part first. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. To be uh, called an abolitionist was something like being called a communist in the 1950s. It was, um, it, it was it, uh, something that was, um, you, were, you were marked and tainted. Um, the abolitionist movement was a small movement, and people who were anti-slavery were not necessarily abolitionists. Um, it grew up, and there were different parts to it and different uh, kinds of people in it who had different understandings of what even abolitionism was. There were sp it was something like the left wing. Um, there, it was highly sectarian. People fought each other. They were uh, often not nice to each other. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was really not nice to Frederick Douglass. And, um, they had different ideas of what was possible. There were abolitionists who believed in who, uh, immediate emancipation and uh, no involvement in the political system whatsoever, that it was a work of the devil uh, and should be completely destroyed and the Constitution burned. There were others who believed that the Constitution itself was uh, an anti-slavery document, that it did not legalize slavery, and, and uh, and that uh, there needed to be a political movement. Those were people like uh, Salmon Chase. Um, they created the Free Soil Party. Um, uh, Lincoln is a Whig. He's outside of that, but he's anti-slavery. When he is a congressman in his one term, um, Lincoln tries to create, there's, there's enormous tension and conflict over what to do as a result of the consequences of the Mexican War. Wh uh, the Mexican War creates the conditions that lead to the Civil War. Uh, a huge amount of territory in the West is, is taken from Mexico. Will it be slave or free? That will affect the, ba the political economic balance in the country. Who is going to control this country? What is this country going to become? Is it going to become slave or free? Uh, Northern uh, congressmen support something called the Wilmot Proviso. Democrats and Whigs that will limit the ex, ex, uh, ex, extension of slavery into the new territories. It never passes. Lincoln calls himself a pro proviso man, and he votes for it numerous times. When that fails, Lincoln gets together in the boarding house that he lives in, which is now the site of the Library of Congress, facing um, the Capitol. And he gets, it, that place is known as Abolition House. Uh, and the leading abolitionists in the Congress live there with Lincoln. And together, and they hammer out this consensus bill for emancipation in the District of Columbia. And it's a compromise bill. Lincoln's trying to figure out how to do this politically. It never even gets proposed on the floor of the House. The conditions are not even right for that. But Lincoln's always trying to figure out, even early on, how to advance things and do it politically, bring things together. Um, and of course, uh, later, uh, he moves to different positions according to the circumstances and the political conditions. So I think that's part of the answer. Well, th there's a tendency to look at anti-slavery in terms of race and not labor, as I've said. And there's also a tendency uh, to sort of backdate things as though Lincoln, you know, foresees that A, he will become president, 
B, that he will preside over the destruction of slavery in the United States, which in this period, you know, obviously this is, is something inconceivable to Lincoln himself. Uh, so if, if we put ourselves back in this era of, of this volume, of, of the multi-volume biography, uh, the assumption is that there will be a graduated end. Well, first you have to contain slavery. That's the first thing. Everything is lost if slavery becomes universalized, as, as many of the southern uh, slave owners want. So that's the first priority. Then generations, over many generations, presumably, there will be some kind of gradual uh, end to slavery. Now, uh, for many uh, African Americans, as well as for some you know, white abolitionists, this would be accompanied by colonization defined as voluntary immigration to Liberia or you know, in some cases to the Caribbean elsewhere. Uh, some colonizationists, uh, I would argue that some of the southern slave owners who, like Madison, who were, were colonization, I, I think this was white supremacy, it was racism. That is, they did not want free blacks living in the United States. But on the other hand, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, you know, was sympathetic to this. Uh, Martin Delaney, who was one of the most important African-American intellectuals of, of the 19th century, uh, debate disagreed with Frederick Douglass who said, no, this is our home. You know, uh, uh, African-Americans or, 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 you know, Negroes in, in, in the terminology of those days are just as American as anyone else. But so this actually, it, it doesn't, you know, fall on racist, anti-racist lines. Uh, and it was certainly the case uh, that politically, coupling the idea of gradual emancipation with colonization as a voluntary option, not forcible deportation, uh, was a way of, of somewhat allaying the white backlash that was going to come to any discussion of emancipation. Yeah, these are complicated uh, issues. Uh, colonization is a movement also of um, uh, considered to be a, a, a philanthropic movement of uh, benevolent and benign uh, wealthy people uh, to help uh, resolve the question of uh, slavery and that they will remove uh, blacks to their native home in Africa uh, and it will reflect well on them. Of course, it reflects condescension and white supremacy, but we're dealing with a very uh, different period. Some of the people who do this are also involved politically in efforts at gradual compensated emancipation early on. Um, and eventually, some free blacks, uh, a favorite among other th uh, things, uh, and it's a form of uh, early uh, black nationalism and even pan-Africanism, which have their roots in this. So these are very complex phenomena as they uh, develop. Back, just one comment on the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. Douglas was one of the, um, was a far greater demagogue than um, Donald Trump. He was, um, uh, f he was now, uh, yes, he was an alcoholic and died of alcoholism, but he was also much more formidable, much more knowledgeable, um, uh, and skillful, uh, and understood government, and was very experienced, mm -hmm. um, and was uh, very difficult to handle. And uh, Lincoln often talked about how hard it was to handle Douglas's illogic and non sequiturs. <laughs> and uh, Douglas was very clever. He was, uh, and he was uh, ferocious in debate. He was even physically intimidating, although he was barely five feet tall. Uh, uh, he, and he was a ferocious racist who often used the, the N-word frequently in public and on the floor of the, uh, of the Congress. Um, and he, w he used racism as a club to beat people politically. And that's what the link, that is at the heart of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Douglas is trying to do that to Lincoln in Illinois, which was the most racist northern state, Illinois. Uh, and it, uh, it was a state that was heavily Democratic. This is where Lincoln, this is also part of Lincoln's thinking. Heavily Democratic, populated by people from Kentucky, with no northern Illinois as we know it. Um, there's no Chicago, <laughs> really, until the, uh, Douglas builds the Illinois Central Railroad. And then Chicago just booms and takes off. And um, uh, there's a migration to northern Illinois. And after 1848, 
there's a huge migration of Irish and Germans, which creates an anti-immigrant movement, which we might talk about later. But this is what Lincoln's dealing with, with Douglas. And these are very um, dangerous politics to deal with. And Lincoln is trying to skillfully defend himself um, and his position against this virulent racism that has wide popularity. Well, there was, on, the, on that point, there was uh, an experiment in having uh, high school kids uh, listen to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which supposedly were a much higher standard than today. Uh, and I read a newspaper report that they were horrified <laughs> by the sheer racism <laughs> and, and demagogy and, and so on. Let me follow up on, on a more uh, the political side of this. The, you, you mentioned some of the things with Douglas, which I'd like you to expand a little bit on. But uh, at this time, it, it's also amazingly violent. A lot of his formative moments, the, the big speech at the Lyceum, came in response to the killing of, of Elijah Lovejoy. Um, uh, other things of that nature. Can you tell us a bit some of your, your favorite anecdotes, of that formative anecdotes of, of the politics of the time that shaped Lincoln's approach to uh, how he viewed the world, how he viewed democracy, how he viewed his own potential rise in politics and, and barriers and things of that nature. Well, you mentioned <coughs> the uh, Lyceum Address. Yeah. That's a really interesting episode of early Lincoln. It's his first formal speech. It's, um, and he is, um, he's a young man. He's, um, he's been in the legislature, uh, and he is, um, it's, um, He's about 30 years old, um, and here's, what, here's the background to it. Uh, Elijah Lovejoy is an, abolition, uh, an abolitionist uh, uh, minister and uh, editor uh, f from New England, and he comes to first St. Louis uh, from where he is expelled for publishing anti-slavery views. Uh, in uh, St. Louis, a uh, free black uh, who is a dock worker uh, who tried to stop a policeman from arresting people was uh, himself uh, 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 imprisoned and then uh, captured by a mob and burned alive. Uh, uh, then Lovejoy goes to Alton, Illinois. He publishes his newspaper again. Uh, mobs destroy his printing press. He gets a new printing press. Before he can put it into place in the warehouse, there's a pitch battle. Uh, and the mob, led by uh, local office holders, the most prominent people in, in, the, in the area, attack him and murder him. Uh, and he is a martyr to uh, the anti-slavery cause and the cause of freedom of the press, which is one and the same at the time, uh, the ability to publish these views. Lincoln delivers his speech in that context. He denounces the violations of the rule of law um, and the murder of Lovejoy, although not by name, uh, and mob violence. And he warns uh, presciently in his own way against the rise of uh, a titanic figure who would rise above the Constitution and the laws and the bounds of uh, ordinary politics on the basis of, Lincoln says, celebrity and fame and warns against such a figure. He has in mind Stephen A. Douglas. S uh, some, like the literary critic Edmund Wilson, believe that Lincoln was talking about himself and that this is a form of uh, his own, you know, psycho-autobiography, which it was not. Uh, once you can trace what he really said to various articles that he had written anonymously uh, for the local newspaper. Uh, um, well, let, let me just say this is one oh. of the, the great services of of of, uh, of of Sid's research. Now, this is a, an original argument. Uh, it's based on the phrase "towering giant," which uh, Sid has established. He, uh, Lincoln uses in contexts other than the Lyceum speech, uh, and you know this just shows you uh, the importance of, of this method. That you can't simply go read a couple of Lincoln speeches and then dream up this whole philosophical, you know, psychological interpretation. You have to look at the context. What are the, there, there are some um, perhaps less than favorable portraits of him as well, and one of the, the more interesting ones, which leads to an, a, a near duel, and I would like you to explain here, uh, is, is, is Lincoln going undercover to write the Rebecca letters 
and perhaps ending up in a duel that, that would have deprived us of, of his uh, leadership later on. Can you talk about that? And then secondly, uh, which I had never read before, and I don't know if Michael had either, um, his relationship to the rise of Mormonism in, 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 in Illinois and how that shaped his, his anti-slavery approach and his fight with Douglas. So both of those anecdotes I thought were just really fascinating. These, these are two seminal um, incidents in the life of Lincoln which are often passed over. Uh, the, in, the, in the first, Lincoln would often write anonymous um, articles and editorials in the Sangamo Journal, which was the Whig paper in Springfield, uh, of which he was the virtual co-editor, although he was never his own publicist. And Lincoln um, would write, a, he wrote a series of articles under a pseudonym against um, Stephen A. Douglas's closest political ally, a man named James Shields, who was the leader of the Irish in Illinois and crucial to Douglas in the Democratic Party. Uh, and he ridiculed him uh, personally and his relations with women. Uh, Shields got very upset um, and uh, it, uh, demanded that, uh, exposed Lincoln as the writer Lincoln uh, was also defending somebody, the honor of somebody else who was his co-writer of these nasty, dirty little articles, and that was Mary Todd, uh, who was a very political woman and trying to win him over. Uh, and Lincoln protected her and uh, challenges, and uh, Shields challenges him to a duel. Uh, Lincoln picks the weapons, l long broadswords, because he has longer arms than shield. <laughs> <laughs> and he practices cutting the grass and so on. Uh, Mary Todd's cousin, a man named John J. Hardin, who is a state representative, uh, uh, who is of a uh, more distinguished uh, family background, uh, rides up at the key moment as hundreds of spectators are there and says, that's enough of this nonsense. You're not going to do this. It is also illegal. This is an embarrassment. You've humiliated yourself. That's it. Um, the result of this incident is that uh, Lincoln proposes to Mary Todd <laughs> <laughs> that was a great and sure. makes himself an honest man. Um, so that's very important in that. Lincoln and Mormonism is almost an unknown chapter but it's really the story of the early Mormon church and or Illinois politics. Um, the Mormons dominated Illinois politics in the early 1840s, which led to what was called the Illinois Mormon War. Um, I won't go through the entire history of the Mormons, but uh, Joseph Smith, uh, uh, the prophet, um, goes from upstate New York with his revelations of uh, many things uh, to Ohio where he's expelled after uh, counterfeiting money and creating a fake bank, uh, to Missouri uh, where he is expelled uh, for uh, also various other um, enterprises and uh, uh, comes to um, a place on the Mississippi River on the Illinois side that he calls Nauvoo and creates a gigantic colony um, and begins drawing immigrants from the, uh, uh, from, from the poorest of the poor from the mills of England in recruiting efforts, mm -hmm. promising them paradise, the Mormons become the swing vote in the state of Illinois. And uh, the uh, Democrats and the Whigs vie for them. Initially, Lincoln's favorable to them. After all, these are, you know, religious refugees, you know, uh, let's live and let live. Um, Stephen A. Douglas gets in closer to them and becomes their uh, protector, and, they, and Joe Smith throws himself in with Douglas and throws their votes. At the same time, there's, there's a lot of wacky stuff going on, like Joseph Smith declaring that uh, the laws of Illinois do not apply to this city. And as a result, every you know, river pirate on the Mississippi declares himself a citizen of Nauvoo and is free <laughs> from all laws, becomes a criminal center, um, then uh, dissidents in the colony uh, expose uh, the bigamy, uh, which then offends the entire uh, state. Um, and uh, an open warfare breaks out between Nauvoo and neighboring towns. Uh, people are heavily armed, they have militias, and uh, uh, Smith has created his own militia, which he calls the Nauvoo Legion, which is all armed. Douglas has uh, given them weapons from the state armory. Um, 
Lincoln, uh, Doug, uh, Smith has betrayed the Whigs. Lincoln is not pro-Mormon anymore. <laughs> and eventually what happens is that um, the mobs kill Smith, as we know. He's murdered. Um, and the Mormons, led by Brigham Young, who was there, lead them on a trek across the continent to the Great Salt Lake. And they all leave uh, Illinois. However, um, anti-Mormonism becomes an important element in American politics. The, uh, and uh, Lincoln eventually, and Lincoln always compares uh, Mormonism to slavery uh, uh, in his rhetoric. He uh, later- A polygamy. Because of the polygamy, polygamy right? It's the cause of polygamy. Yeah, yeah. Lincoln considers uh, Mormonism as it existed then, as it existed then to be a form of slavery of women. Lincoln was uh, very unusual in his advocacy of uh, voting rights for women from the beginning of his career for his first race for the state legislature. Um, he, he enacted the anti-bigamy law as president just a, a short time before the Emancipation Proclamation. And for Lincoln, these two were linked, these ideas. Well, that was, that was the case for the Lincoln Republicans uh, in, in the 1860s. Uh, you know, they would link the Southern Confederate slave owners with the Mormon polygamists. Uh, and this gets back to the point about modernity. They didn't use that term, but they did use the term barbarism. Uh, and so here, and remember their model is industrial Britain, it's modernizing Britain, Germany, France, you know, Western Europe. The U.S. is a quasi-developed country. And they just look with horror on these people defending slavery, you know, by quoting medieval and ancient, you know, biblical precedents right. and polygamy of women from biblical patriarch patriarchal times. So we tend to think nowadays of this in terms of individual rights, and that's part of it. But there also was, the, you know, Lincoln and his fellow Whigs and Republicans had this sense of historical progression. And the polygamy and slavery were dragging the U.S. back this goes, into this, primitivism. This goes back to Lincoln's uh, idea of the enlightenment yeah. of his reading of, of Tom Paine and, and others. Volney. And And Volney, a French philosopher about religion. Uh, the f we forget that the first platform of the Republican Party in 1856 declared itself against the twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. This, uh, the book is, is filled with all sorts of uh, interesting anecdotes that show you know, the pragmatic nature and the, of the application of his principles. But I, I want to finish up quickly with um, you know, Lincoln's legacy today. And, and Michael, you've written about this. Um, you know, he, he's an Ike. Everybody claims Lincoln as their own in some capacity. Everybody finds something they want from him. Um, the early progressives in particular really talked about Lincoln's nationalism. Um, and I, I wonder if you both could give your thoughts on Lincoln's long-term, obviously we have a few more volumes to come in your book, uh, so there's good stuff to come, but uh, his long-term impact in terms of, the, of later politics in the United States, how his ideas played out. Well, uh, if, let's look at the right first. Uh, so if you look at the traditions, uh, many of them still extant that Lincoln despised, Jacksonian populism, you know, free market uh, libertarianism, uh, states' rights, uh, which, uh, as Sid has pointed out, he would always put quotes around. Uh, you know, fervent Protestant, you know, religiosity. What party are these found in today, right? <laughs> I, I would say no more on that subject. Uh, uh, now, the center-left's historic uh, link to Lincoln is, is, you know, somewhat complex. I would argue that... Uh, largely because of the influence of Theodore Roosevelt and, and also uh, the early New Republic uh, under its first editor, Herbert Crowley, uh, who was uh, initially for Theodore Roosevelt, later became pro-Wilson. Uh, there, there was this link, that is Theodore Roosevelt and the liberal Republicans, you know, many of the mugwumps, came out of the reform wing of the post-Civil War Republican Party. Uh, and and they, they saw the the stalwart Republicans had just become a corrupt machine and they were continuing these ideals uh, for, you know, in, in the changed circumstances of an industrial and urban America. Uh, I think there's another strain associated with uh, Brandeis and Woodrow Wilson, both of whom were Southerners. Brandeis is from uh, Kentucky. Uh, 
which was emphasizing more small business, uh, antitrust and competition rather than just accepting large scale modern industry. And I think that tension continues to this day on the center left. I would just add one element, which was that um, Lincoln was not only not a nativist, uh, but he was um, adamantly opposed to the anti-immigrant movement of his day. And it was uh, uh, crucial to his politics. Uh, Lincoln could not form the Illinois Republican Party, of which, which he did, of which he was the political leader and, was, and did form until he uh, was engaged in the politics of disrupting the anti-immigrant movement known as the Know-Nothings or the American Party of its day that wanted to make America great again, whose principle was... No, no, but most, this is an important point, most of them were Whigs. Most of them were they Whigs were not, from his own party. They were not Southern Jacksonians. They were Northern Whigs like Lincoln, and this was a temptation for these Northern Whigs. When the Whig party fell apart, over uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the opening of whether or not uh, the Western territories would be slave or free, the uh, Whig Party uh, split apart between Northern and Southern wings. And at the same time, it, uh, the, it, uh, parts of it then uh, joined this anti-immigrant movement as a result of the wave of immigration from 1848 of the Irish and Germans, if I can say that fast. And, um, uh, they were known as the Know Nothings or the American Party. Their principle was that no, um, no, uh, oh, that only native-born Protestants should hold public office in the United States. You but, had to but, be native-born, and you and you had to be Protestant, both. And Lincoln uh, had to deal with this in order to bring those people in by disrupting their party, and in order to create a broad coalition that would become the Republican Party to deal with the uh, overwhelming issue of the extension of slavery. Right, but see, this is why I think that all of these comparisons of Trumpian nativism to the know-nothings are historically illiterate. Uh, the know-nothings were these progressive, mostly anti-slavery, enlightened Northern Whigs. They, they were trying, they saw their enemy as the alliance of the Southern slaveholders with the Irish Catholic immigrants in their political machines in the Northeast, more than the Germans. Uh, it was more of an anti-Catholic, anti-Irish thing. And so uh, the basic uh, debate and, and, uh, was who's the more immediate threat, the Northeastern uh, Irish Catholic immigrants or their allies, the Southern slave owners. So no nothing has nothing whatsoever to do with ignorance or you know, being a lower class person. Uh, it was more like Yale skull, skull and Bones, because the more conspiratorial members of the nativist elite in the Northeast were convinced that the Pope, through his Jesuits, you know, were corrupting America. Uh, and since you couldn't tell an Irishman by looking at him, uh, you had to be careful about what you said. So if you were asked, if you were a member of the American Party, that's the nativist party, you were supposed to, sort of like Skull and Bones, are you part of Skull and Bones at Yale? Well, you're supposed to walk out of the room, which is kind of a giveaway, but you were supposed to say, I know nothing of such a party. That's what it comes yeah. from. It's not a reference so, to ignorance. So let, me, so a, uh, let me just we, say one more yeah. thing, which is Lincoln wrote to his close friend, Joshua Speed, in 1855, that those who believed in this anti-immigrant movement were... Um, in favor of oppressing white people in the same way that slaveholders oppressed Negroes, as he said. And he said they should go um, to, a, to a country like Russia with, that lacks the base alloy of hypocrisy. Those are Lincoln's words. Um, as I said, this is much better than, than half of your high school history classes, and I, I appreciate there's so much more to talk about in the book. Uh, Sid is going to be available to sign some books. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us, and, and, and Sid, best of luck with the, with the rest of your book tour on this, and, and two more volumes you're writing, or? There are going to be four, and four volumes. one a year, and that's my plan. Well, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for a great discussion. So.